I have an autoimmune disease called ulcerative colitis. This is a disease that causes inflammation, bleeding, and ulcers in the large intestine. If you ask a doctor, they'll say that there's no known cause and no known cure for this disease. The only thing that you can do if medicine fails is to surgically remove the entire colon. About a year and a half ago, my body started shutting down from this disease. I was insanely sick. I had extreme diarrhea over 20 times a day. It was like the worst food poisoning you can imagine. I was bleeding internally and had started developing anemia. And I was so sick that my girlfriend literally thought that I was dying. I was terrified. So you might be thinking to yourself, why do I care about this guy's disease? I don't have this. My gut's fine. I feel healthy. Well, 45% of you in the Western world have some form of chronic disease. 15% of you have an autoimmune disease like me. More and more health issues are no longer outliers. They're now becoming the norm. Take a look at this graph. On the left, you can see that in the past 60 years, infectious diseases have dropped dramatically. And that is really amazing. But at the same time, autoimmune diseases and chronic disease are skyrocketing. Researchers wanted to understand better the prevalence of celiac disease. So they looked at blood samples from soldiers taken 60 years ago and compared them to blood samples taken today. What they found was that celiac disease is now 4.5 times more likely than it was 60 years ago. Food allergies have increased by 50% since 1997. And peanut and tree nut allergies specifically are now three times more common than they were 20 years ago. Interestingly, this seems to be a problem that's mostly confined to the Western world. So in the United Kingdom, uh, rates of type 1 diabetes are 10 times more likely among kids than they are in Pakistan. But if a child from Pakistan moves to the United Kingdom, they then become equally likely to those UK natives to have type 1 diabetes. This is a problem that right now medicine has no explanation for, no idea of why or how it's happening. And it is our responsibility as innovators and entrepreneurs to focus on this issue. So I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis my freshman year of college when I was at MIT. And dealing with the ups and downs of this disease, of the related gut issues, of the pain, of the issues that just came along with it, I was motivated to focus my career on health when I graduated. So I founded a company called NEMA and, uh, to help people with gut issues like me, people with food allergies and food intolerances. And we built an incredible product, the world's first portable, beautiful, easy to use lab in your pocket where someone who has a gluten sensitivity or celiac disease and very soon peanut could sit down at a restaurant, take a tiny little sample of their food, put it into our device, and then within minutes know if that food was contaminated or not. This was a mission that I believed in so much. And at the same time, I was growing incredibly. I learned how to build a company from the ground up. We shipped thousands of products. And we were even awarded one of Time Magazine's best inventions of the year. So from an outsider's perspective, I was on top of the world. But internally, I was broken. Every compliment that I received tasted like ash because I was falling apart. My body was disintegrating. I'd started a company to provide a solution for people with issues like mine, but at the same time, I was killing myself. Where did I go wrong? So when I got sick, I went to see my doctor, naturally, to find out what I could do. And my doctor recommended one last drug that I could try, the only one that I hadn't tried yet. And if that didn't work, I would have to start preparing to have my colon cut out of my body. I looked up the stats on that drug and I found out that it had about a 15% chance of getting me into remission and keeping me there. And I did not like those odds. So I decided to get a second opinion, talk to another doctor. He was a little bit more blunt. He basically just said, you should go have surgery. So at that point, I realized that if I was going to get healthy and actually keep my colon, the only way that I could do that was if I empowered myself, took my health into my own hands. And so that was exactly what I did. Now, some of you might be remember the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, where almost 5 million barrels of oil flowed into the ocean. Now, one of the primary ways that they worked to clean that up was by adding another chemical to the oil to cause it to disperse and sink into the ocean. They essentially tried to clean up chemicals with more chemicals. 
And I realized that that was exactly what I had been doing. Every other month, I would go to the hospital and I would have IV pharmaceutical drugs pumped into my arm to try to d treat the disease in my intestines. I was pouring chemicals into my body, but it wasn't working. For the past eight years, I had been managing my disease, but disease management is not the future. Health is the future. There's a concept that I love, that of health span versus lifespan. Lifespan is simple. It's just how long you live for. But health span is how long you're alive, but free from disease and healthy. And that's the measure that actually really matters. The human body is an incredibly complex system. And if we want to enable health, we need to treat the system that is the human body in a comprehensive way. For multifaceted issues like chronic disease, autoimmune disease, food allergies, a single drug that targets a single chemical pathway in a single part of our body has not developed a cure. We live in a culture that's predisposed to look for silver bullets, for those magic pills that will make all of our problems go away. But those silver bullets, things like the polio vaccine, penicillin, smallpox, those have mostly been discovered and used already. Today, drug discovery is becoming more and more difficult. Nine out of 10 drugs that are created today and reach clinical trials fail because they're either unsafe for humans or they're ineffective. It's time for us to change the paradigm of one of looking for silver bullets to one of comprehensive health. So in the 1960s, most of us are probably too young to remember this, but the rivers and waterways in America were so polluted and so full of oil that they literally lit on fire. Now to solve this problem, the EPA didn't just try to put out those fires and then allow companies and cities to keep dumping their waste into the ocean. No, they worked to stop the problem at the source. And so I decided to do the same. Now I'm not a doctor, but I am an MIT trained engineer. And to me, this was something that I could apply an engineering and a problem solving mindset to. So I jumped into research. And I wanted to understand not just how I could treat my symptoms, but I needed to understand the why and the how of what was happening so that I could start working to find the root cause and to fix it at the source. And through my research, I realized that there was a common thread, a theme that linked everything together. And that theme was the microbiome. So the microbiome is a community of organisms, microbes, that live in or on our bodies, most of them being in our gut. We think of the microbiome mostly as bacteria, but it's actually also viruses, fungi, bacteriophages, and helminths. And while I started by looking for a cure and how to help my specific condition, what I realized is that the microbiome actually impacts the health of every single one of you. And we can think of our, of our bodies, of our health, of our genetics as a chain. And if our microbiome is unhealthy, it's only a matter of time before the weakest link in that chain is going to break. For me, that weakest link turned into ulcerative colitis. For someone else, it might be obesity, diabetes, Parkinson's disease. You're thinking the microbiome that's in your gut, how does, how does that affect all these other things? That doesn't make any sense. Well, try it yourself. You can go on Google Scholar, search for medical papers, type in the microbiome and autism and you'll find out that microbiome-specific treatment has caused a 25% or more reduction in autism symptoms in kids. Type in the microbiome and autoimmune disease, and you'll find out that researchers have actually found specific bacteria in the gut that travel to different parts of the body and create diseases as diverse as lupus or autoimmune liver disease. Type in the microbiome and depression, and you'll find out that 90% of our serotonin is produced in our gut. And when researchers took germ-free mice, those are mice that had their microbiome wiped out, they started producing 60% less serotonin. When they then reintroduced the microbiome, their serotonin produ production went back to normal. So it is becoming easier and easier for us today to track our health by ourselves. We no longer have to do this just with a doctor. We're becoming empowered with technology that we can wear on our wrists. We can test ourselves at home rather than just at the doctor. We're democratizing access to lab-grade chemistry. So when I got sick, I decided to use that technology that was available to me to help me in my own journey. And the first thing that I did was look at my microbiome. I knew that from my research, even just one course of antibiotics can permanently alter your microbiome. And I had been on, a on antibiotics for months at a time as a kid. So I used an at-home test 
where I took a sample of my microbiome, sent it into a lab. A few weeks later, I got results on, on my computer that showed that I only had 10% bacterial diversity. So I decided to do something that was a bit drastic, although arguably it's a lot less dra drastic than cutting out an organ from my body. And I underwent what's called fecal microbiota transplant. Now this is a relatively new treatment that is actually exactly what it sounds like. It's where the poop and therefore the microbiome from a healthy donor is taken. It's mixed with saline solution and it has the solid waste material filtered out to essentially leave a bacterial water mixture that's then introduced into the colon of a person like me via a colonoscopy, an enema, or sometimes even capsules. So for a month, every day, I had this treatment done. And after five days, for the first time in over five years, I took a solid poop. <laughs> and <laughs> it was great. And within a month, after every drug that I had ever tried had failed, I was finally in remission. It was a, an incredible experience. <laughs> so I had gotten my microbiome to a much better place. I knew I still had further to go, and I wanted to understand how I could also keep my microbiome healthy but continue to improve it. We live in a world now of technology, and we look for technological solutions to a lot of things, but a lot of times the solution can be a lot simpler than that. In this case, I was able to use technology to help me really understand what was going on, but in this situation, the solution was just so simple. It was just diet. So let's jump into some science so I can explain this in more detail. All of you inside your gut have a mucosal membrane. This is a protective layer, a barrier, that, uh, in between your gut bacteria and the food waste and your intestinal lining. If this mucosal membrane is degraded, if it has any holes in it, then your bacteria and your food waste can actually interact directly with your gut lining, which can cause an immune response, it can cause inflammation, and it can lead to what's known as leaky gut, where literally food particles and bacteria will leak through your intestinal lining directly into your bloodstream. This can cause a whole host of issues. It can cause food allergies and intolerances. It can cause chronic inflammation through your entire body and can lead to autoimmune diseases and chronic diseases like what I have. But our microbiome can actually help keep us healthy. When we eat plant matter, fiber, resistant starch, our microbiome actually consumes that fiber to produce a compound that's called butyrate. And butyrate is the fuel source for our intestinal cells to produce mucin, which then repairs that intestinal lining, repairs the mucosal membrane, and reduces inflammation. Now, on the flip side, we also have some bacteria in our gut called sulfate-reducing bacteria. These guys are not nice. They consume sulfur in our food to produce hydrogen sulfide gas. This is that toxic, rotten egg-smelling gas. We've all smelled it. That is genotoxic. It causes inflammation. and actually breaks down that mucosal membrane. And I found out that the primary sources of sulfur in our diet are from the amino acids methionine and cysteine that are found primarily in animal protein. So here I learned something actually really amazing. The fiber from plants leads to butyrate production, which helps heal the mucosal membrane and reduces inflammation. But the sulfur from meat causes hydrogen sulfide production, which damages that mucosal membrane and causes inflammation. Now, my entire life, I'd been completely against a vegan or a vegetarian diet, but I'm a man of science, and here the science was clear. The next day, I switched to a plant-based diet, and ever since then, I have felt so much better. The exciting thing here is, though, that we have barely scratched the surface of health and the technological empowerment that we have available to us. Think about it. It's, it was only 15 years ago that we first mapped the human genome. 90% of the research that we have on the microbiome has come out in only the past five years. So we've just touched the surface, and this is really where we need the trends of tomorrow to focus. The exciting thing is that this movement has already started. A friend of mine from MIT is using artificial intelligence and machine learning to look at how the microbiome actually impacts chronic disease. There are companies that are using your personal physiological health data to help provide better preventative medicine. 
And my company, NEMA, is using tools and technology so that you can stay healthy before you get sick rather than just reacting afterwards. So all of these technologies are amazing and they're all coming out now. This is really the future of health. And this is where we have to focus. I have so much hope in our future. In 50 years, we're gonna think that it was absolutely crazy that we thought that we were gonna live with chronic diseases or autoimmune diseases for the rest of our lives. Every day, startups, private companies, individual researchers are developing new technologies, coming out with new research that is driving us forward in the right direction. But we still need more focus here. So what I ask from everyone who's listening to this today is to make a choice to impact the future. Make a choice to look at yourself, look at your friends, look at your family, and don't just work on something that could help today or is interesting today. Think about your children and your children's children and how you can make the world a better place. Every one of you has the ability to impact the mindsets of your friends and your families and the organizations that you're in or to be entrepreneurs and to move us forward. So standing on the stage right now today, I'm making the commitment and holding myself accountable to sit at the intersection of health and technology and to help provide the conversations and the tools for us to move our health systems in the right way and for people to empower themselves in their own health journeys. We are the generation that will eliminate chronic disease. I know that this is possible and I will work tirelessly until we have accomplished that. So please join me. Thank you. Thank you.